Ahead of next week's G7 reckoning, the PM has laid out his foreign policy priorities. The basic gist, lots of China, but light on for climate. The world's developed economies only want one thing. Net zero. Net zero. Net zero. By 2050. 2050. 2050. And ahead of G7, they've been putting the hard word on Australia using both the carrot and the stick. But rather than meet and beat the rest of the world's expectations, Morrison seems determined to tap dance around them. It's not about if or when. It's about protecting and advancing Australia's interests. In that context, it's about the how. And he's not so keen on carbon tariffs. Which is simply trade protectionism by another name. On the subject of China, the PM was a little less delicate. Rapid military modernisation. Tension over territorial claims. Heightened economic coercion, undermining of international law, through to enhanced disinformation, foreign interference, cyber threats. Where there are no consequences for coercive behaviour, there is little incentive for restraint. In other words, it's a jungle out there and... We must tend to the gardening with renewed clarity, unity and purpose. To achieve that, Morrison wants to arm the World Trade Organisation with a metaphorical whippersnipper to keep China in check and to restore... A world order that favours freedom over autocracy and authoritarianism. Pretty stern stuff. So was the PM quietly summoning the drums of war, or was he just sitting alone in a purple room playing an epic solo in a gorilla suit? Greatest of all time, former PM. The song. I realised that. Yeah, you were good too, Ronnie. I'm sure. <laughs> good intro. <laughs> former PM Kevin Rudds. I uh, heard the song before, and he joins us now. Kevin, it was probably the strongest that Scott Morrison has been on China. What do you think his goal is here? Uh, to respond to the latest round of Liberal Party um, market research, which says be hairy chested and improve your domestic polling. Look, the proposal that he's put forward, which is some new power for the WTO, how long is it going to take to implement that? Probably forever. Uh, will it actually improve the current level of trade bans by China against us? Probably not. And so I don't think it actually is materially relevant. Last point is, he talks about the need for greater manufacturing resilience in Australia. Well, uh, that starts with, for example, having a viable motor vehicle manufacturing capacity in this country, which his government has already killed. So I think it's big on rhetoric, but frankly, short on delivery. Kevin, do you think this Prime Minister gets China at all? Oh, look, I think um, the Liberal Party governments have gone up and down on China. First three or four years after we lost office in 2013, the whole mantra was uh, the previous Labor government under myself and Julia Gillard, that we'd got China all wrong uh, because we were so hard line on them. Then we get to around about 2017 and they go in exactly the reverse direction, that we're all too soft on China. We think it's time to actually have a balanced approach. So I think the big problem for Scott Morrison is that he sees China as this continued domestic political market opportunity to show himself to be hairy chested rather than map out a clear course of action to defend our values, but to keep our exports rolling at the same time. Other governments have done that. His government can do it too. Well, he's clearly banking on some backup from key allies. Do you think he'll get it? Well, look, both the United States and, uh, frankly, the major countries of Europe, France, Britain, Germany, uh, together with the European Union and Brussels, they already have a relatively coherent position between them. Uh, on the global challenge which China represents to the liberal international rules-based system. So I think Mr Morrison's message is primarily aimed at the domestic Australian political audience rather than the international audience. But if you're going to go to, for example, President Biden and the Europeans with an ask on China, then why the hell aren't you also delivering what they need, which is a robust Australian uh, commitment on climate, rather than simply being the odd man out in the room which is not in Australia's interests at all, particularly if we're looking after the barrier reef, jobs and long-term tourism in this country. Thank you for delivering me to climate change, which is the other topic that we wanted to discuss. Um, because the EU, in its trade negotiations with Australia, is threatening to impose carbon tariffs, which effectively would be like a carbon tax on Australian industry from without, <laughs> um, rather than us passing one ourselves. Um, Australia is really trying very hard to resist that. Who do you think is going to win on that? 
Look, I think to be fair to the Europeans, they've been signalling this for probably the last three to four years. And in fact, you know, people like myself and others in the international community have been saying this is where Europe is headed and it's also what Biden has begun to embrace as well. So what's the logic here? It's saying we're not going to have a system in the global economy where a bunch of us put effectively prices on carbon um, and thereby affect to some extent our global competitiveness as a result of doing that and let other economies like Australia off the hook entirely. That's the logic which underpins the so-called carbon border tax. The best thing for Scott Morrison to do to avoid it is just get with the program. Increase your commitment on greenhouse gas reductions by 2030. Every other country in the room, bar India, will be doing that at the G7 meeting. Why not Australia, particularly when we're already the driest continent on Earth and we've got the most to lose through out of control climate change? Mm. All right, Kevin, we'll have to leave it there, but thanks for your time tonight. Good to be with you.